So today we will learn that astronomy is beneficial for society. And, and of course, we all knew that, but, but I mean really beneficial in, in a way that goes beyond scientific publications and, and beyond research and beyond um, advancements in, in big data. Astronomy is really capable of, of much more and, and really has an impact on, on society um, as a whole. And to speak to us on this topic today is Professor Ewine van Dishoek. So, Professor, a warm welcome to you, especially. Um, you. Professor van Dishoek, yeah, hi. <laughs> She is a professor of molecular astrophysics at the Leiden University in the Netherlands and, and really had a long and outstanding career and has held many, many important positions at, at renowned institutes uh, around the world. And um, Harvard and, and Princeton are, are just, just two of them. Um, her work was, was awarded and honored many times over the years. If you want to see the full list, please go to her Wikipedia page. I uh, just wanted to mention one. Um, in 2018, she was awarded the James Greg Watson Medal by the National Academy of, of Sciences in the, in the US. So obviously, uh, she's a very active person uh, and also outside the scientific arena. And, and uh, that at the moment is really wonderfully reflected in the fact that she is the president of the International Astronomical Union. Um, and she will address this, the, the topic of today in, in that role and then we'll explain a little bit more about the activities of the um, IAU, which uh, really like, like SK is very much a global, global endeavor. So we're very uh, much looking forward to that. Um, before we turn to, to her presentation, let me first ask Phil Diamond, the Director General of SKA, to, to just say a few words on this topic and, and maybe from, a, from an SKA and, and radio astronomy perspective. Phil? Thank you, Tice, and uh, thank you, Avina, for agreeing to, uh, to, to give a talk in our, uh, our, our series of, of presentations. Uh, and I'm actually very, very pleased to see the, uh, the international attendance uh, uh, there's, uh, there's people from, uh, I see we have Australians late in the evening, um, uh, Canadians uh, quite early in the morning, and uh, quite a few uh, from, from Europe, even Africa and India as well. So, so you, you have actually a quite diverse audience. I see the numbers are slowly, slowly climbing. Um, so Tice asked me just to, uh, to provide a brief uh, introduction to, to your broad topic uh, from a radio astronomy perspective. So I, I have three slides, if, if I may. Um, so I'll just, just touch on, on these, which, which hopefully will provide a sort of a parochial uh, view on the, the impact of radio astronomy, Avina, before you talk about the, uh, the broader impact. So. This is, uh, this is what the, the SKA we hope will look like with the Indian Ocean represented by the line uh, down, down the, uh, the middle there. Um, but ra radio astronomy has been a very interesting tool for science diplomacy, which is, is one aspect of impact, uh, which, which many of our colleagues don't necessarily uh, um, uh, recognize. And in fact, the IAU, of course, which you, Avina, are currently the president of the IAU, um, was a, a vital tool um, for links in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, between Western and uh, scientists, Western scientists and those from the USSR uh, in the midst of the, uh, uh, the coldest period of the Cold War. And uh, radio astronomy was one of the, the various tools used by, by different countries as an icebreaker in terms of this, with uh, scientific visits uh, in particular from the UK to, to the UK by USSR, uh, using the, the, the Lovell telescope um, for, to, to, to uh, track spacecraft in, in planetary missions and missions to the moon. In 1963, Sir Bernard Lovell, the then director of the Jodrell Bank, was invited to Crimea to give a series of lectures. 
And this was actually encouraged by the UK's Joint Intelligence Bureau, which was uh, um, part of the, the government intelligence uh, services. Um, and they talked there about uh, the OBI to, to understand the, the newly discovered quasars, the planned joint radar observations of, of Venus. And this led actually to many collaborations and visits uh, between uh, the USSR and the UK post uh, Khrushchev. Um, and in fact, the OBI was one of these tools that, uh, that developed and it's quite, a, quite an interesting um, history here, which I don't have time to, to go through, but it was one of those things that was seen as um, harmless in a, in a sense, uh, in that it was, it was um, scientific exchanges, but not with uh, military technology except that um, in order to transfer uh, the accurate time signal around, um, atomic clocks, uh, actually frequency standards, um, had to be um, transferred from the, uh, uh, to, to, to support the telescopes in the USSR. And it's good to see uh, uh, John Black and uh, Harald on the screen there because Sweden played a role here in, in that, um, one of the, the first atomic clock that was trans that was moved by by plane, its battery expired, so another one had to be uh, hastily um, arranged from uh, uh, from the Onslaught <coughs> Space Observatory and trans transferred by Stockholm to Leningrad. Anyway, this 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 all broke the ice, and it's an interesting example of scientific diplomacy. My final slide just shows some other examples of impact that have emerged from radio astronomy. Uh, in, in different technical areas. Invention of Wi-Fi, I think being the most well-known, but uh, in, in the other areas that, that you see up on the, the screen there. And for the SKA specifically, we, we see uh, good examples growing already, human capital development in Africa, um, some of the other others that I do list there. Uh, astrotourism, um, our Chinese colleagues have built uh, um, a small city close to FAST to support the, uh, the visitors uh, to, the, to the FAST telescope in Southwest China. And of course, recently our South African colleagues have led the way in the support of COVID-19 initiatives with their system engineering team uh, developing uh, modern uh, respirators. So all, all of this is, uh, is part of the impact that, that flows from a big project. And maybe just to, uh, to make you smile a little bit, uh, there is one that maybe we, I, I don't like to advertise too much, but the under, one of the underlying algorithms behind the uh, number plate recognition for speed cameras uh, was originally developed for radio astronomy. Um, blame the University of Cambridge uh, for, for this. That, that's, <laughs> that's where it came from. Anyway, I, I hope that, that sort of gives a fairly parochial introduction to, uh, uh, to, to this subject, but um, over to you, Avina. Yeah, maybe, maybe just to, to jump in real quick. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Phil. Th those are really, really excellent examples. Um, yeah, so, so now without further ado, please, Avina, can you share your presentation? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thijs, and thanks also, Phil, for this uh, introduction. Um, as you will see, I will indeed touch on some of these uh, issues that you just discussed, which are indeed beautiful examples of how astronomy contributes uh, to society. Um, so when Thijs and I discussed this, um, he asked me to, to, to talk about the astronomy and the impact of society. But then I realized that this was going to be a rather mixed audience uh, with uh, probably quite a number of astronomers also online. Um, so I uh, um, um, bargained with uh, Thijs to be able to also interject uh, about 15 minutes of science <laughs> there uh, to uh, also touch on some recent results from ALMA, which uh, may link with uh, some of the SKA science cases. That's uh, good. Um, any case, I'm speaking here indeed uh, primarily as president of the International Astronomical Union, and um, I wish I could be there in front of you um, and uh, have a real interaction, face-to-face -face interaction with you. Uh, that's unfortunately still not possible, but on the other hand, we have seen already that this pandemic has also had a few good outcomes, and that is that we are more connected than ever 
across the world. And indeed, I'm very pleased to see both Australia and, and Canada on the line. Uh, welcome. Um, so astronomy is, is, is certainly, of all the sciences that we know, um, special in its ability to connect this society, even with social distancing, if you, if you see over here. Because after all, we are all below the same night sky. It's available to all of us. It's everywhere in the world. And we can ponder it. We can ponder where do we come from and what is our place in the universe. And that is a, an asset that, uh, that's, is, that we should never forget and that will happen uh, uh, anyhow. And um, what we do as the IEU, uh, since not all of you on the line may be familiar with it, we are the worldwide union of all of the professional astronomers. And our main um, mission is basically to promote and safeguard astronomy in all its aspects, and then through international cooperation. And the aspects these days are much more than just research. Uh, originally, a lot of the IEU was concerned with uh, bringing people together for scientific symposia. Uh, but right. now we have much more than that. We have communication, we have education, and we have development. And of course, it's, it's also done at the national level. It's done, say, at the European or at the Canadian or an Australian level. But the IEU is the one uh, organization that brings the entire world together. Now, we were founded uh, 100 years ago. Uh, we have uh, some 12,000 uh, members, 82 member countries, and 107 nationalities. And we have increasing diversity. I'll show you some details about that. Um, still only 18% of women, disappointingly low, but growing. And again, I'll show some more about that uh, later. The IU is run by the officers, um, and that's the president, the president-elect, the uh, general secretary, and the assistant general secretary that you see over here. At the, uh, probably uh, last uh, IAU uh, cocktail that we had in uh, uh, Paris for all of our international connections uh, there, but that will certainly not happen uh, this year. So we were founded uh, um, in 1919 actually at the Palace of the Academies in Brussels, and that's where we celebrated our 100 years, uh, almost a uh, little over a year uh, ago in a flagship uh, event. So you can more of that in that uh, video, but the whole theme of that flagship event was basically astronomy and society. Um, so uh, there were some, some very good speakers there uh, from all across the world uh, that spoke on that topic. So um, that's certainly a good place to go back to um, if you want to hear more about that. Um, we celebrated the uh, 100 years um, uh, across 2019, and we decided to make it really a worldwide set of fest uh, festivities. Uh, when we first started to contemplate it, we had something, you know, relatively small in mind. We knew that we could never sort of uh, uh, get to the level that the International Year of Astronomy was in 2009, but we thought we could do, you know, something nice. Um, but over the year, actually, in preparation in 2018, our ambitions grew and grew. And also thanks to our partners that provided uh, financial support, including uh, SKA. Many thanks uh, for that, Phil. Uh, in the end, we were able to do more than 5,000 activities in more than 140 countries, and uh, quite a number of them were focused indeed also in, on inclusiveness and promoting diversity. Uh, in the end, we reached some uh, 5 to 10 million people directly, um, and probably more than 100 million people in uh, total. And you can download this, this final report where you can see more about um, what actually happened. One of the activities uh, was certainly also a traveling exhibition, um, one that could also be downloaded and uh, adapted in any language, so it's a completely open source exhibition um, that uh, basically told the story of astronomy uh, over the past 100 years. It was both the science, but also the technology that we highlighted it's for every decade sort of of the past century and also then the impact on society. So those were the three elements that we put in that, uh, uh, in that exhibition. And of course, we know that our view of the universe has changed enormously over the last 100 years. Uh, in 1990, we knew only one galaxy, the Milky Way. And now, of course, we know uh, billions of galaxies. 1990 was also the year of the solar eclipse um, when Einstein 
the theory was uh, proven right. And uh, very fitting uh, this year, we have the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for the study of black holes, especially in the center of the Milky Way. Um, this, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, Nobel Prize is to be awarded next week virtually, unfortunately, and <laughs> not, uh, not in person in, uh, in Stockholm. Um, but that's wonderful to celebrate it. And of course, we also had in uh, 2019, the, the famous image of the shadow of the supermassive black hole um, that was actually uh, revealed just uh, on the day before our 100 year celebration. Uh, gravitational waves have uh, certainly taken center stage and uh, linked directly with uh, massive star evolution. And there's, of course, a lot of work going in that uh, direction as well. In 1990, we did not know even where the elements in our body were produced. And, and now we have this uh, beautiful images of uh, various elements, uh, for example, a supernova remnant. Exoplanets were only speculated in 1990. Uh, by now we have discovered some 4,000 uh, exoplanets and we know that they are very common. On average, every star has at least uh, one planet around them. Again, Nobel Prize in 2019. Um, and uh, now the next step in terms of the study of their atmospheric composition is, uh, is happening, is starting to uh, be developed. And then the, the billion <laughs> dollar question, namely how were we formed some 4.6 billion years ago? And again, we have uh, fascinating new missions there, the Rosetta mission that landed on a comet. And, uh, just a few years ago for the first time and sniffed all the gases that were coming out. Um, but also very recently, Hayabusa 2, uh, which will shortly deliver its uh, uh, sample, actually, I think in Australia uh, later this month. Uh, and then Osiris-Rex, which has picked up uh, a, a substantial amount of uh, material from uh, um, Bennu asteroid and is delivering now that uh, on its way to Earth. So these are all messengers from our own early solar system, and that will tell us something about these questions. So let me tell you a little bit an uh, intermezzo for a few minutes on uh, some ALMA results um, that we've had. Uh, because again, looking back uh, some 25 years ago, um, this was one of these iconic HST images um, that uh, came out a little bit serendipitously of the mission, um, but really, uh, highlighted the fact um, which people had speculated about for centuries that um, young stars are surrounded by disks out of which planets can form. But these pictures really um, sort of highlighted the size and that they are common. Then 20 years later came this, another iconic image of a young disk, uh, but now it's Alma. And uh, again, we see here uh, something of the size of our own solar system. There's a lot of structure in there, a lot of unexpected structure. And we are still trying to find out actually what that uh, structure means. So ALMA was really necessary to build because these disks, which you see here in an um, uh, artist impression, uh, are actually small. I mean, on the image sort of of this uh, black here cloud, um, they are, you can hardly see them, uh, about a five to a thousand smaller. So the sharpness of Alma was really needed to zoom in on these forming stars and disks. <clears throat> and again, to show you the improvements that Alma had, uh, this was previous uh, uh, SMA observations, a full night, one of the best nights on Mauna Kea for maybe 16 hours, uh, two times eight hours integration, um, and was sort of a, an image with not high fidelity. Alma already in cycle zero is just 24 minutes, and was able to produce an image that had much uh, more sharpness and also uh, much higher fidelity. So I see that uh, Lewis is actually uh, on the line. So Lewis, uh, many thanks also to you for helping to make uh, uh, Alma operational. Davina, just and, to, to mention that the, the sound quality is a little bit up and down. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's fixable, but I just wanted to manage. So we can we can understand what you're saying. Uh, okay, it's, it's yeah, I'm, uh, the, I'm here in the, the, the my um, connection may not be as stable as uh, <laughs> that, so that's maybe the, the, the connection that is going up and down a little bit. No. All right, good. Um, so I'll try to come a little bit closer. 
Um, so here we actually are now in a new era of observational planet formation. Um, we have these fascinating images of disks um, that you see over here. Almost every day you see on SWH a new image coming in. These rings, these cavities, these spiral structures even, um, and uh, um, what they actually mean is still very much under discussion. But one explanation certainly is that they could be triggered actually by a, a planet that is there and creating a, um, a pressure bump in which particles can be trapped and thereby also grow to larger uh, particles. And certainly the ALMA large programs, such as the d program that has now uh, um, and we published a couple of years ago and show these structures in sort of the 20s brightest disks that had been imaged at very high angular resolution with ALMA. But this also raises the question as to how common are these structures? What do they tell us? How do these disks fit into the general disk population? Because these are really the brightest disks. These are not the common disks. And for that, you really need to look at a much larger sample of uh, disks and, and also look at the structure of there and how you build them up and uh, that you see here in sort of this um, uh, star formation and planet formation sequence. And one of the things that we're learning actually is that um, uh, planet formation will likely start already at an earlier stage than we thought before, already in the embedded stage of uh, star formation. This is also where you build up the molecular complexity. So this is linking a little bit to the uh, yeah. of life uh, theme of uh, SKA. I just want to sh show here how OMA is already revolutionizing this field um, with um, detections of molecules now around solar mass protostars at the very earliest stages and now on solar system scales. These are molecules that we're seeing on the scales of the orbit of the Neptune or Saturn. Um, and we see already their complexity and going into larger and larger molecules. Uh, although amino acids have not yet been uh, detected, but certainly um, isocyanates, um, which are sort of the beginnings of peptide bonds, um, we see them already in um, some of these uh, surveys. And, and again, on solar system scales, that's what ALMA now brings. What ALMA brings is that we go from detailed studies of a few of the brightest disks to um, to the real samples. And I was just want to show you one example of the, the Lupus Alma disk survey that was led by Johnson Williams and involved quite a number of us. Um, let's take a molecular cloud and just target with Alma all the young stars that are in there with infrared access. One minute, just one minute each. Alma, that's the sensitivity that Alma has. And here you see sort of a gallery of those one minute images in the continuum. We're looking here at the thermal dust emission from these disks. And you see already the variety of disks. You see at the top here, you see a number of the, 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 the brightest disks and the largest disks also, but then the bulk of the disks are actually small. They are not resolved even at 20 astronomical units uh, resolution. Uh, so the bulk of the disks are really small in the in the dust. There are only sort of a, a top 10 to 20 percent that are really bright. We could also tell uh, something about the mass available for building planets, um, because what we can do is basically convert our flux into uh, dust mass, and uh, then we can look at the number of disks that have a certain mass. So just to orient you, here is. 10 Earth masses, that is what you need for giant planet formation. And you see is <clears throat> one minute of uh, online integration, you already get to lunar masses uh, in terms of sensitivity. But what you see here for our Lupus survey, and the same has been found for other surveys in other uh, clouds, is that the bulk of the disks, um, more than 75%, um, actually do not have enough mass for the standard giant planet formation model, the core accretion model to form a giant planet. So either this has to happen already earlier than this stage, the, the Titori stage basically of disks, um, and or there are only a few uh, stars really with uh, giant planets. You also see a, a large decrease with age. And indeed, when we go to the embedded phase of star formation, then we see that there is a sort of a, a factor of 10 to 20 to 50 almost uh, more mass available 
in order to build uh, planets. Um, and this is uh, something that was actually done at longer wavelengths at nine millimeters um, in order to, to really get sort of to the optically thin limits that you need for these, um, uh, for these bright disks. So planet formation efficiency, if you can now even compare it with sort of the solid mass that is an exoplanet, uh, then you see that uh, uh, only when you go to young disks, you actually have enough mass in order to build uh, planets, not in the mature disks. So that's an important message, and that will also be important for our scaling. Um, how about high mass sources? Um, Remarkably, here is the Orion molecular cloud that most of you know well. Here is the trapezium region. Here is the rest of the cloud. And we serendipitously have quite a number of uh, disks there actually targeted uh, in that uh, region. And to make a long story short, um, the disks in a high mass star forming region like Orion look remarkably like a low mass star forming region like Lupus. It's only when you cloud close to the UV radiation in the Orion nebular cluster uh, that you find a much lower disk mass. You see here a shift again uh, to much lower dust masses. Uh, and that means that really UV is important in the evolution. It photo evaporates uh, basically the disks uh, at a certain rate. So environments, especially the UV, does matter for building planets. And in fact, we have now confirmed this with a much larger survey. This was taken just before the ALMA lockdown, uh, targeting 882 disks in Orion A, led by Sirk van der Wischa. And uh, again, we find for those 880 disks that the bulk of them really are remarkably similar to the disks in uh, Lucas, but now with a much smaller uncertainty that we have due to the large statistics. And again, in the same cloud, uh, Orion, uh, the earlier stages, the class zero and class one disks are a lot more massive. So again, stressing that planet formation really must start early. How about these subs substructures? Well, this was our class, uh, our cycle zero image. And now look at that with band four at high angular resolution. You see that what looked like an asymmetric disk is actually separating into a beautifully symmetric ring and then one of these asymmetric vortices. And these vortices move to the wavelength. So again, this is important to go to learn longer wavelengths to lower frequencies in order to see really the largest dust grains that are trapped there and learn about how these dust traps and how these vortices work. We also see now these transitional disks with these cavities as a part of the population. They really belong to the most massive disks. Uh, they are among the largest disks. They are not among the smallest disks. And so it looks like there are almost two evolutionary pathways of disks. The spectacular ones that have these large disks and all of these ring structures, et cetera. And those are the ones that may lead to the giant planets at large distances. Uh, but then there's also a huge population of small disks. This is the majority of the disks that maybe just turn into a, a faint disk. I think what will be important for SKA is to really probe sort of these, these, these inner uh, optically thick parts uh, where even at uh, Alma longest wavelengths, uh, we become optically thick. And so to end this sort of uh, um, science part, it's really uh, sort of dust traps, snow lines, uh, what we now see are regulating not only the disk structure, but also what ends up in exoplanet abundances. So the, really the abundances that where and where, when you build your your planets, your terrestrial planets, your giants, your ice giants, and how they are related to these snow lines will really determine sort of their abundances. And that is a very fascinating and interesting field that is growing at this very moment, linking exoplanet and disk compositions. So that is where the future is going. Good. So back to IAU and uh, astronomy and its impact for society, because I just talked to you about what you would call blue skies research. <laughs> Although um, uh, it certainly also addresses these bigger questions that we have in terms of our place in the universe and the possibility for life elsewhere in the universe. I think that's what we are just starting to unravel with the combination of ALMA and uh, large uh, optical and uh, radio facilities. Um, we've already seen, and I think uh, um, 
Phil gave a number of very nice examples that uh, um, where our technology has actually found applications in a society uh, like the Wi-Fi that is in um, our iPhones. Um, from the IEU, we've also made a small booklet of some of these technical applications, and I know that the RIS also has a number of these nice uh, applications. Um, this is a well-known cartoon, but I still like it, uh, for, especially for people who are not familiar with science. Uh, this is the world. You might, might see a very peaceful and a rabbit eating a uh, carrot. Uh, but then when you think about all the equations that go into, uh, um, into this world, <laughs> then you see how much science is really at, uh, at the heart of, uh, of everything that we see uh, around us. If we look at sort of where science has impact, um, I think we see a growing importance of the space sector. And uh, that was certainly also stressed at, at various meetings that we've been to recently. We see that uh, this uh, also developing countries getting more and more involved in the space sector and launching their own small satellites, uh, set cubes, et cetera, um, going on missions to the moon and uh, beyond. Um, and I think that will certainly continue to be a growing um, uh, sector, uh, not just for looking up, but also for looking down, of course, and, and seeing what is happening uh, on Earth. Astronomy is connected uh, with, uh, um, um, with various sectors. Um, of course, the science parts that we talked already about, um, with chemistry, with mass, with physics, biology and earth sciences. Of course, with the technology, the big data, the electronics, the space, the optics, uh, this working together um, through the big na national, multinational projects, as we see over here. I think the open data, the open archives that are accessible anywhere in the world are so important. That's really where uh, astronomy has been leading and other uh, sciences are only starting to catch up in that, uh, in that respect. But now realizing, especially with COVID-19, also the importance of, of open sharing of, uh, of data. And, and SKA is, of course, a, a very nice example of another uh, worldwide project uh, that we have here. Uh, one part here that is very dear to my own heart is this part, uh, the culture and society, uh, linking with philosophy, uh, the inspiration will come to that, education, uh, anthropology. Um, this is a wonderful quote from Dame Anne Glover uh, when she was at our IU 100 uh, celebration and spoke there about how science can liberate, uh, really. Um, also through art. Um, in fact, one of my own hobbies is art and astronomy. Um, of course, living in the Netherlands, Vincent van Gogh is a beautiful example of that. Um, but also, if you go to Australia, the Milky Way Dreamings, uh, Australia Aboriginal art is, is just fantastic in that uh, regard. And that's why I've so much enjoyed the SKA Chef Skies exhibitions, uh, because that's exactly what you're highlighting here as well, um, is uh, the direct relation with, uh, with art and, and culture. Okay, um, let me then now turn more as to what does the IEU actually do? Um, we have a new strategic plan um, uh, that was adopted at the General Assembly in 2018, and that's actually started implementation this year. You can download it it's on the IEU website, and I encourage you to just browse a little bit through it to get a flavor of uh, what our plans are. The IEU uh, does not do everything itself in terms of its central office. Um, the IEU itself is for, for knowledge advancement, but then we have sort of our offices, um, starting with the Office for Young Astronomer um, that organizes the International Schools for Young Astronomers, the ESIAS, already since 1967, which have been very important and also in training of young astronomers. Um, that's now uh, hosted at, uh, in Norway. Of course, the Office of Astronomy for Development in Cape Town, the Office of Astronomy uh, for uh, Outreach and Communication, in OAO in Tokyo, and then the brand new Office of Astronomy Education that came out of the new strategic plan that has been uh, active since 2019 in, in Heidelberg. 
So, and of course, uh, there are all kinds of uh, uh, interconnections between these offices. Not everything goes through the central part, um, but this is really sort of the backbone of the uh, IAU. We bring people together worldwide. Um, we do that in, through our symposia, our scientific symposia, um, of which there are nine per year. Also the regional meetings, which have been very successful, um, uh, especially in the, uh, in the African regions, the Pacific regions, and in the Latin American uh, regions. Um, and then the GA is once every three years. And just yesterday, we had to announce, unfortunately, that our meeting in that was supposed to happen in August 2021 in Busan has to be moved to 2022 um, in order to make it a hybrid meeting and make sure that enough people can travel actually to South Korea. So put August 2022 in your agenda for, uh, for Busan. Uh, South Africa actually is where we're going in 2024. So both of these meetings will be actually very important. We have other tasks and uh, coordinations. Um, astronomical standards is an important aspect. Uh, naming of astronomical objects, surface features, as you see over here. The dark and sky, quiet sky protection is very uh, active at this very moment. Um, um, as you well know, this is, of course, also important for radio astronomy. And we had a very uh, well attended uh, and lively workshop in October, out of which is coming a, a big report. And that will also then go to UNOSA, the U United Nations uh, Office for Outer Space, uh, um, in order to um, sort of raise awareness and uh, make sure that we can sort of uh, minimize uh, mitigate the impact of these new satellite trains and uh, other um, sky light pollution, uh, light and radio pollutions. Global coordination, I already mentioned, we had actually just before the lockdown a very successful workshop on transients, of course, involving SKA in Cape Town there. And this is uh, certainly uh, something where there will be a lot of international collaboration um, and this is a report that will be posted there. We stimulate uh, women and diversity. Um, women in astronomy, junior members working in groups, also diversity and inclusiveness uh, that you see over here. Um, in fact, we had a whole uh, symposia actually on astronomy for equity, diversity and inclusion that happened in uh, November last year. And in fact, there's a springboard to action that's about to be launched in the next uh, few oh, days. Right. That's, uh, this comes out of that with some I'm recommendation. Um, we also have prizes. We have prizes for PhD students. So uh, that line is actually in 10 days. So please, uh, if you uh, can nominate uh, people still before that uh, date. Um, also, the group of fellowships have been very successful in promoting young astronomers. Uh, and again, the proposal deadline for that is March 31st. So, so think about that, uh, because that provides actually quite a bit of research funding. Um, education, training and development is, of course, at the heart of the IAU, as you have seen. Um, our International School for Young Astronomers has been very successful. I think we've trained uh, over 1,600 uh, and master students, PhD students, many of them which have actually gone on to become leaders in their, uh, in their countries. And so that has been a, a very successful one. Uh, as part of IAU 100, we had Einstein schools, which centered on gravity, actually at high schools, um, which again have been uh, successful in, in training quite a number of uh, um, young people. Um, then again, that's more at master's and PhD level, uh, beginning PhD level, uh, hands-on training at telescopes, big data. Um, this is uh, one example in Namibia here, very successful uh, workshops. Um, and then uh, we also can use sort of the climate change on other planets in order to teach uh, at various school levels the importance of uh, how too much CO2 in an atmosphere can actually uh, leads to a runaway uh, greenhouse effect. Teacher training, we need to not only reach the students, but we also need to reach the teachers. That's just as important. And so we have various programs for that. And they are really, again, across the world. We often use small telescopes for that. So we have a whole project 
uh, in order to distribute uh, small telescopes across the world, especially to places where they are difficult to, to get. Um, and here you see some examples of that uh, actually uh, across the across the globe. And we have, in fact, even special COVID-19 projects in order to, uh, to continue those uh, activities. A stormy day in school was also one example that really stimulated a lot of astronomers to go into schools. Uh, some of you and myself may be used to that, to doing that regularly, but that's certainly not the case in all uh, countries. And this was really uh, having sort of a fixed week uh, where we did that uh, really stimulated uh, a lot of people to go into schools and uh, do activities uh, there. And you see some successful examples uh, over here. Uh, and especially here in this case, uh, the wonderful uh, Molomaba project in South Africa that uh, has been very successful in that, uh, in that respect. A few words on empowering women um, and diversity. Um, we have sort of annually around the International Day of uh, Women and Girls in Science in, in February. Um, and uh, I think it's important, very important, in fact, that we continue to stimulate that. Um, I, let me just show you a few examples of where we stand as the IAU. Um, so this is actually the IAU membership. So remember that IAU members are faculty. Uh, they do not include PhD students. And um, until recently, until we had the junior members, uh, they did not include any postdocs. So here's actually interesting to see sort of over the decades, the evolution of the percentage of female members. And you see that uh, uh, it's only starting to, to climb sort of in, in recent years. It's still uh, disappointingly low. And especially sort of after the Second World War, you see uh, what a big um, uh, boom there was in faculty appointments, but, but very few females uh, actually in, um, appointed in that period. So this is a long-term statistics evolve, of course, only slowly, um, but, um, but we're certainly working on that. And you can see already some evolutions. So this is uh, the gender distribution in 2015. So most of the countries are green. That means that we are between 10 and 20% of female IEU members. Uh, the ones that are blue are clearly not good. That's less than 10 percent so you see big countries like india and japan in that category um, the yellow and the reds are already somewhat better uh, at least above average 20 to 30 percent and then you get especially to the southern europe uh, countries and the uh, latin american countries now here in 2018 um, you see some uh, changes uh, india has gone green <laughs> from blue uh, japan is still one of the large uh, astronomy countries where there's a lot of work uh, needed in that uh, in that respect and so those are then uh, based on these kinds of maps and you see actually Russia also turned uh, turned orange actually um, these are the kind of maps that we're actually uh, using to target also specific countries and and give them a little push and saying hey you should really do better in this uh, respect we're also tracking uh, sort of female speakers at IAU symposia um, especially how they um, compare with the uh, overall participants invited and contributed. Um, you see here a, a, a very strong symposium, uh, and this is on the other hand the symposium that the organizers will probably not be invited again to, um, to organize uh, there. So just to summarize, um, fraction is still low, we're working on that. Uh, fraction in high positions is now high, also at division president level and at executive committee level where we are sort of 50-50 based. Uh, we have actions to attract more women and making them more visible. And here I also want to sort of make a plea to those of you uh, who are active in the IAU, uh, you can really grow into leadership positions by taking uh, uh, first leadership positions in working groups, commissions, and uh, for example, organizing IAU symposia. So let me then end by talking a little bit more about the OED and the, OED and the, the developments uh, that we are doing. Uh, I think the strength of the IAU is really that we have a strong network across the world. Um, we have uh, the OED office in Cape Town, but then we have all these regional offices which are uh, across the globe, and not just in developing countries. This was a very important concept of the OED. It should not just be 
in developing countries, we should also have it in Europe and now also in the United States um, that, uh, that we have them there. The same as the national outreach coordinators, we have a network that actually spans the entire globe, as you can see uh, over here, and that they are in regular contact about it. Um, so the OED is uh, focused on using astronomy for development, so not development of astronomy, although that is part of it, um, but primarily aimed at using astronomy for development. And that then gets immediately on the question of the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And here you see a number <clears throat> of examples uh, there. Um, you see here, for example, the astrotourism. I'll come back to that in a moment. Capacity building, schools, workshops, uh, gender equality, uh, activities targeting, disadvantaged group, astronomy for diplomacy. Indeed, very important. Thank you very much, Phil, for bringing up that example. <laughs> Uh, because I think that is a very important aspect, science for diplomacy. Uh, light pollution, dark skies, uh, all very important. We have actually a European road um, that's probably the closest in terms of uh, linking with uh, uh, Manchester. Um, that is actually uh, hosted at Leiden and it's joined with the European uh, Astronomical Society, as you can see here. Um, inaugurated um, then actually in the presence of uh, Minister Pandor from uh, South Africa. One of the activities that they are doing at the moment is the Pale Blue Dot project, which is of course very well suited uh, to um, uh, raise environmental awareness. We're only that tiny little dot there in the middle of nowhere and to install a sense of global citizenship. And these kinds of images really provide perspective. They install tolerance and also a little bit of modesty of realizing that we are just living on that tiny little rock in the middle of space. The OED has a, a number of flagship projects now. Um, one of them is uh, the um, uh, astrotourism. Uh, other one is indeed the science uh, diplomacy. Uh, and this project actually used flash uh, just uh, yesterday was announced as the winner of the UN Global Climate Action Award. Uh, so that's very nice. It's in the Himalayas uh, where they actually used renewable energies um, to help create sort of uh, a struggle for livelihood. So the challenge here was really economy and remote areas. The assets that this region has in the Himalayas is clear night skies. And the opportunities that they have is actually the engagement with uh, the community, with tourism, and uh, the training that they have. So this was a pilot project. And just to show you how that uh, created Astro Stays, um, trained uh, women in the village uh, to be able to uh, do sort of um, uh, night sky uh, uh, presentations. Uh, in disabilities, um, accessibilities, um, and uh, this was sort of the early results. I think now these numbers in terms of revenue and people engaged have uh, uh, certainly multiplied by uh, by large factors already. So this this shows you already how that can help, uh, how that can happen. Uh, the other flagship is uh, um, centered on diplomacy, like for example here is happening in in Cyprus, the two halves of the island. Uh, bringing children together that otherwise would never see each other and uh, talk a completely different language, yet through the uh, sort of language of the skies, uh, through astronomy, they can actually uh, communicate with each other and, uh, and meet, meet each other. So this is again a pilot that can be rolled out to, to more uh, uh, countries. So where do we go from here? Um, next hundred years. Um, See at least the next decades. <laughs> of course, our common goals uh, that unite us. Uh, we have our joint facilities, we have our big surveys, including SKA, the big data, XF archiving analysis, new technologies, publishing standards, that will all help. Them. And of course, it needs to happen in a sustainable way, including the increasing amount of uh, computing. And I think here is, is again, um, the Big Dara project is a very nice example of, of doing that, of using astronomy for development in Africa. 
uh, through hackathons, workshops, scholarships, etc. And some of these activities are already joined uh, with the uh, IAU uh, OED. Um, in terms of new technologies, uh, we see uh, again synergies, um, large survey synergies. Here's just one example that is happening again in South Africa, which is already uh, in involving quite a lot of local students, is uh, say the Meerkat um, uh, radio telescope, but then also the Meerlicht, um, which um, does the optical um, follow up, or I should say almost simultaneous uh, imaging. Uh, our worldwide collaborations will continue to enrich societies um, and then targeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as you see over here, and especially through the regional nodes of the OED, we can um, uh, strengthen that in, in many different uh, ways. But the future is, of course, the next generation. And this is, again, well, to, to come back to what, in my view, is where astronomy contributes most to society. And that is basically inspiring the young generation. And these are Minister Pandor's words. And she gave a speech at the United Nations workshop a couple of months ago. Astronomy inspires curiosity, optimism, and hope. And indeed, you can couple that with that curiosity once you have children uh, inspired with curiosity, that is a driver for innovation, not necessarily in astronomy, but somewhere else in society. And so please, I think that is what we need to do, is to make sure that we harness that inspiration of astronomy for society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor van Dissel. That was, that was a really, really good presentation both on the, the the science that you're involved in as well as well as the the truly inspirational activities by the uh, by the IAU so so thank you for that um we have a little bit of time uh left not too much but but some time for uh, for discussion and questions um i will keep an eye on the participants list i'm, I'm sure you all know by now after all these months in lockdown, how to to raise your blue hand? So, in case you have a question, please, please do. Let me let me kick off with um, one from my side. Uh, I was amazed by the the number of um, member countries of the IAU, eighty two. My God! Uh, so, within the SKA project, we we try to manage with, well, let's say sixteen countries, and it's it's already. <laughs> incredibly incredibly difficult so how on yes, earth yeah, you yeah, 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 to that's, get uh, the, yeah, on the same yeah. line well exactly and and that's why also what i find now um that uh, I, I mean i want to also as president i want to be able to connect with as many of the countries as possible and um um, so before COVID, I did that through traveling to all different parts of the world and, 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 and engaging with them. But now, actually, what I find is that with uh, uh, the new situation, I'm actually in one week, I can visit uh, the Middle East and South Africa and the Philippines and uh, uh, Brazil uh, all in one week and engage with them. But I think it's important to make all of the countries uh, that we have as the IAU to feel to make them feel equally welcome to our IAU family. And uh, um, I think thanks to all of our networks, um, that is uh, one way of, of making sure that we that we can do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so speaking on yeah, sort of relying on, on the member states. Um, I, I can see that the IAU might have ambitions, uh, such as written down in the um, in the 10 year plan, but, but there's always this dependency on the, the member states, for example, to increase um, uh, the gender balance, you always depend on, on actions within the country. Yeah. So that, that, that must be maybe even frustrating at, 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 at some time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that is uh, um, indeed we are, of course, depending on the on getting the funding from that. So <laughs> uh, making sure the, to the member states that they are good, getting good value for money in terms of the activities that we are able to do. We are only a very small office. I mean, we have only uh, two people uh, full time employed. The rest is it's almost entirely volunteer work. Uh, the, uh, the the IAU so. Um, so we're relying a lot on that uh, to do to, to make it happen, so to say. 
Um, but, uh, but indeed, uh, um, I, I think that if we see that one country needs sort of a, a push in a certain direction, we can, we can try and help there with, uh, with actions. Mm -hmm. I can see Lewis has a, has a question. Lewis? Yeah, hi, Avina. Thanks very much for a very wide ranging talk. I have a, what I think is a, a, a simple question. I just wonder if in your role um, as the IAU president, you have the sense that the, um, the knowledge or, or recognition of the connection between pure science and impact in other areas is increasing amongst our political masters or perhaps more importantly their advisors or, or, or whether you think uh, whether you think things are static or, or how you see that uh, well it's a good question um, I see that not just as IEU president but also my role in the Netherlands uh, yeah. that and it, I must say it's varying um, it's uh, there's unfortunately still as, as I think most of you know the, the sort of short term um, gains uh, um, impact, uh, politicians looking for short-term impacts uh, view that is still very much prevalent. Um, I think people underestimate the importance of education um, and uh, sort of the, um, the long-term impact that it had of inspiring young children. I, I find, I'm surprised actually <laughs> uh, to what extent that is um, sort of underappreciated in uh, um, uh, sort of by the um, uh, policymakers. And so I think we need to, to continue to stress that. They always ask, of course, for, um, uh, for numbers then. Um, it's, uh, you, can, you can, of course, do some measurements of how much impact a certain project has. But uh, if you want to do it properly, you have to really do a longitudinal study, you know, children that are exposed at age five to seven <laughs> to astronomy, you know, what happens with them when they are 15 or 20 years old. Um, so it's very hard. There are plenty of anecdotal st um, uh, stories about that, but um, uh, sort of there's a little bit of this obsession with um, um, sort of um, hard numbers uh, to, to, to back that up. Um, but that, that shouldn't uh, that shouldn't prevent us from doing that. <laughs> I think that's the message. I think we should just uh, um, really really stress the importance of education. Thanks. You're muted, Tos. Apologies for that. So. I was going to say we're, we're going into overtime, but I, I, I do think that we have time for, for two more questions. So first it's Tyler Burke and, and after that, Joe Obibi. Tyler? Yeah, hi, Avina. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, you asked those of us in IAU to maybe think about committing a bit more time to IAU activities. I'm just curious to know those of you who are already committing time to significant activities, how much, how much time do you think this might involve? Do uh, year basis or so. Yeah, so. yeah it, it varies a lot. I mean, that can uh, range from organizing IAU symposia or being chair of a working group or a division. Uh, some of that is not more than uh, a few days <laughs> per year. Uh, other people, uh, of course, putting quite a bit of uh, their personal time in, into it, so especially those that are in the officers and that are at the executive committee level. Although the, even the executive committee level is, is, is not, um, I would say, that heavy compared with other uh, uh, division presidents. That's certainly a, um, uh, a position that requires quite a bit of work and activities. Uh, so we're, we're always looking for uh, people that are really good and active um, division presidents. Do you need sort of good support from their employer as well, I imagine, for those sort of positions? Well, yes, not good support, but some support is always helpful, especially in reduced teaching load or something like that. That, that helps, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tyler. Joe, you got the last question. Uh, thank you very much, Elena, for this uh, presentation. I'm quite pleased to see uh, the progress you've made in Africa 
but I use the word Africa because uh, if we really speak of countries, I can only see very few countries, South Africa and, and maybe a few other countries that are actually represented. So it seems there's still a lot of work to be done in Africa, which are really disproportionately represented in astronomy. Yes. So what targets do you have as part yeah, of a strategic exactly. plan to address that? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm very glad that you bring that up because uh, indeed, um, um, when you look sort of at our activities and where you look where all the, for also for IE100, where you look where we have our network, there's a big sort of gap still in West Africa. And uh, that is where we need to do a lot. So I was actually very pleased on my way to Principe Island for the 100 year celebration of the Eddington expedition. I actually stopped in Nigeria uh, to visit the West African uh, road. And then I also stopped in Ghana to uh, uh, talk with the people there that are involved with the planetarium and with the, uh, the large uh, single dish uh, radio telescope. And I could see already how that is, is being developed there, but, but they really need sort of to have, um, um, yeah, they need, they need a lot of support still in terms of training, in terms of uh, building sort of their community. And there's, there's fantastic work being done actually by the West African uh, Road. Um, but uh, also in terms of the, uh, they have a wonderful program with the internally displaced people that uh, basically come from the, the north part of Nigeria, um, but being uh, chased away from their uh, regions by Boko Haram and then coming south. And, and there, there are wonderful activities going on there with, uh, with these uh, internally displaced children. Um, but it's 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 a lot of work that still needs to be done there. And I fully agree. We should we should uh, <laughs> put try and put more effort there. Okay. So we're going to close this um, uh, this session, uh, Professor Van Dissoek. Many many thanks for your for your talk uh, even though we are far apart i could really feel the the passion that you have for the activities and, and the science that you do that that really came through so so thank you for for your inspirational talk and and thanks everyone for for attending this one and um, hopefully see you again